This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. I hope your day has got off to a good start. All is going well so far. Now, today's podcast episode looks at football or soccer, a sport that I'm personally involved in a lot, and as are my colleagues at Inspiring Sporting Excellence. The new season's about to begin. It's exciting times ahead. So I thought I'd share with you some insights, courtesy of a guest who has worked in different professional football clubs for a number of years. Jack Flynn Hicks is a sports psychologist who consults now at both Portsmouth Football Club and West Ham United. And we go on to chat about what sports psychology looks like in football, the complexity of our role, cultural beliefs in football, the misconception that our work involves sitting on a couch or educating simply in a classroom. We discuss interpersonal confidence and the importance of it in football where good effective communication is vital to prosper and where blame and criticism can be dished out frequently. And there's also a whole lot more as well. Enjoy. Hi, Jack. It's great to have you on the show today. Would you be willing to share with the listeners your background around sports psychology and your your interest in football? Hi, David. Thank you so much for for having me on the call. Um, uh, It's been a pleasure to be invited on. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so my background in football started just as any, I think, any boy growing up in, in Britain. Uh, I started playing from a very young age and, and really got a passion for it. Um, I've watched football all my life. I'm a senior goalkeeper at Chelsea Football Club. I've had that since the age of seven and it really drew me in and uh, I found a real passion for football just from a really young age, like, like, like those of other boys. Um, and then I think during the university, I found a real passion for sports psychology where I just did a, a normal uh, undergrad in psychology and, and I was given the opportunity to work at Southampton Football Club during my research dissertation under the supervision of a chartered sports psychologist and it really opened my eyes into how I couldn't play to that level so how could I go and work in it and, and that was kind of a real exciting opportunity for me that I wanted to take advantage of um, and then I did my MSc in sports psychology uh, and it kind of grew from there really and I wanted to align the, my passion for psychology with my passion for football um, and it seemed logical to try and work uh, towards that. So, yeah, started off my kind of sports psychology career in football at uh, Luton Town Football Club. So I was there for roughly four seasons, um, working on a part-time basis. And a lot of it was voluntary work. Um, and that was kind of the foundation for my whole training hours and, and things like that. And really gave me a deep insight into into what sports psychology could look like within a football environment. And, and, and even more than that, it just gave me a real insight into how football academies work um, and how how important sports psychology is for those environments. Um, and then now I've progressed into positions at Portsmouth Football Club as the lead psych there and, and also a consultancy role at West Ham. So kind of just moving, trying to move up and, and move through the leagues, but also remembering my roots and understanding where, where I've come from and, and the experiences I've got from working at so many different clubs now. I think that, that that's only going to put me in good stead. So. I'm going to take you back to, to what you mentioned there. What does sports psychology look like then in, in a football academy? It's a really good question, David. I think it's different in every environment. And I think for a sports psychologist going into uh, a football environment, it's really important that you gain a real deep understanding of what the club values are, what the culture is within the club, the history of the club itself. And I've been lucky to work at some clubs that have a real deep history within the game and I think the benefit of, of being a sports psychologist in that is that you can then use those values to then implement your work throughout the or across the academy. Um, I think it changes that the, your, your approach to sports psychology changes also with the, the age of player that you work with. So they would talk about the foundation phase, the youth development phase, and then the professional development phase and, and how you would work across those three different age groups. So for the younger boys and girls, I think you work heavily with the parents and you deliver a lot of psychoeducational workshops and, and trying to just build their understanding and self-awareness of what sports psychology is. 
and then as you move up the up the foundations and through the phases of of academy football, I think you start to then individualize your support a little bit more. You can then increase the complexity and really bring those in and drive it through training sessions and maybe even deliver a lot more on pitch stuff and work quite closely with coaches to enhance that enhance that provision. Um, so I think, as I said earlier, I think it's very unique. It has to be very unique and specific to the football environment you're in. So really enhancing your understanding of that football club is it's only going to enhance your understanding of how to best implement a psychology programme within it. You mentioned there about on-pitch stuff and, and working with coaches collaboratively, I, w- I would imagine. Yeah. Are you able to share some examples of you know when you've done that and on a yeah, successfully and even if you, if you want to share some failures along the way that, that's fine too <laughs> <laughs> oh 100 percent. let's start off with a failure I, I love talking about that i think it's it's important you always say the kind of glamorous side of it um i was working with a really uh respected and and, and also uh a really prominent football figure at, at the club that I, one of the clubs i was at um he said you've got your training kit on you've got your boots on what can't you just stop standing there and do something and, it, and that was a real eye-opener for me right at the start of my career. Um, it showed that just standing there and observing sometimes isn't enough as a sports psychologist. Um, and it really fueled uh, an excitement within inside me that you can be so much more than what your MSc and what the, our formal training kind of suggests that we can be. It doesn't really teach you how to be a, a practical psychologist on the pitch in football and I think that's what coaches want. They they want you to be engaged. They want to see real tangible psychology in action. So that was kind of a, a real eye opener and a bit of a, oh, wow, this is getting quite serious. Um, and it's not just about being in a classroom and delivering psychoeducational workshops or looking at confidence and, and real buzzwords within, within sport. It's about how can you bring psychology to life on the pitch? Um, so players and coaches can can really go oh that's something I can take away from the session today and that's the psychological theme that's running through the session or I've been exposed to some challenges today but I was given the tools to overcome it that's the sort of stuff I think is really important and a lesson that I learned from that experience um, I think from a from a day-to-day working example I think as a psych working within football you're heavily involved within the MDT so the multidisciplinary team um, and we commonly have meetings on a Monday morning where I would offer um, kind of an update on what how the psychology program is is running, uh, what the theme would be for that week, and how it's then integrated within the coaching syllabus. Uh, an update on in, in the individual player work, obviously respecting confidentiality, um, but really just to give an insight for the whole multidisciplinary team of where psychology is for that week, uh, what the expectations were. Um, and, and, and I think that's that's where you can get a real traction with your work as well is showing insight to the whole multidisciplinary team and, and, and really just getting them to ask you questions. Like, how can I utilise you? How can um, I come into a gym session today and enhance the S&C programme? Or how can I be used within the analysis to then go forward and, and, and bring the psychology thread within that? So I hope that answers your question, David. I think so, yeah. <laughs> we talked like off air beforehand about the the psychologist role can be quite a lonely one. I would imagine being being part of that MDT and being involved in those meetings is is absolutely crucial to to be very successful in, in your in your role. Because if you're you are out on a limb, then it, it's quite difficult to educate the other coaches and other staff about exactly what you do. I, I completely agree. I think. As an early career practitioner, I, I still am, I guess. But when I was younger, maybe around the 23, 24 mark, when I was just trying to get into the football environment, I didn't have the the confidence and, and I don't think I thought I believed in my skill set enough to go and really integrate well within an MDT. You felt very much a, a kind of bit on the side or that psychology wasn't really utilized to its maximum capacity and you, you as, on a part-time basis it's really hard to get that traction and, and embed yourself well so I, I always talk about the three r's i think so how you build rapport with someone um the relationships you build with them and then also the respect that that then develops within football i think is really really important so 
building that rapport, not just about talking about football with coaches, talking about their families, what they did on the weekends, what are their interests outside of football, because you all of a sudden become very bogged down within football. It's so intense. You have very little room for movement. You're very structured on your day-to-day processes, right? We're training at this time. We're eating breakfast at this time. We've got a, a gym session at this time. And you become all quite all encompassed within the game. And I think it's really important to have conversations outside that. So that's what I would suggest with any practitioner going into a new environment, just learn about the people and be really inquisitive um, and, and ask questions that aren't really necessarily related to football. Um, I'd also kind of suggest having a really good contextual understanding of football. And whilst that doesn't make you a good psychologist, it definitely helps build those relationships because you understand the language, you can understand training sessions a lot better. Um, that then gives you the confidence to go into training sessions and try and uh, influence it from a psychological perspective and and maybe step up during team talks or give a reflection to a coach on feedback. I think having the, that language and understanding of football has really supported my development within the environment. Um, so, yeah, that that's kind of where I would go with that. An element of, of mental toughness would be interpersonal confidence. It sounds to me that that that's a big thing that you're really talking about there, being able to assert yourself in a, in a group situation, to be able to, I suppose, persuade others to, to um, um, if, you, if you're going to sit back and not get involved, then it's going to make your job a little bit more difficult. I completely agree. I think it does come down to that that interpersonal confidence of how you engage with someone. And I think... In a social setting, I I would be very confident with someone because I understand kind of who I am as a person and and what I can offer to someone in a a social situation. But when I was thrown in the deep end as a sports psychologist, as a trainee, you're constantly trying to problem solve. You're constantly trying to to kind of show your worth to these new people that you've met. And you don't necessarily have those skills to problem solve and and, and have all the answers at at that young kind of stage of your career. So... I would just suggest that the way that you actually have the most impact is through building relationships and having the confidence in in doing that and, and trying to build those those softer skills within your practice before trying to implement a huge psychological program with amazing impact. It's actually going to be way more beneficial to you as a practitioner, but also for the athletes and coaches that you're working with um, because people can see through it. Um, people can see through when you're just trying to throw a load of solutions out there. Um, they'd much rather just a normal person that can have a one-to-one conversation with. Um, and I think that's half the battle. I, I always say sports psychology is is kind of common sense, but that's used more often than not. And I think we're, we're st- we're, we go through life kind of worrying about what we did or worrying about what's going to happen. And we never really focus on what's going on then. And I think that's something that I've really learned mm. to, to deal with in my early interactions is just trying to enjoy the moment and, work in, in football and do what I love, really. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know I interviewed uh, Michael Caulfield, who's involved at Brentford Football Club, and uh, he, he, he was talking about how he walks his dog around the training pitch every now and again. Um, and yeah, I suppose really, yeah, what we're getting at is really trusting your, your skill set, isn't it? And being comfortable in your own skin. I, I agree, yeah. I think even, even at Masters level, you, you've got a real plethora of theoretical understanding um and and whilst i don't think the training courses do give you the best insight into being an applied practitioner you do have a lot of knowledge and you should be confident in that you you've, you've written a lot of papers you've you've read a lot of books you've had to understand a lot of complex psychological theory um and i think the real skill of, of being an applied practitioner is bridging the gap from theory to practice so it can look very very different on on the cold face um and, and theory in a book is very different from how that would then look within an applied setting. Um, so that's something I've really tried to bring to life and, and make sure that the difference between theoretical understanding and then applied practice is is obviously about how you then communicate that to the wider audience and disseminate it effectively. So, yeah, I think that's something that I've really tried to hold on to. So, well, the name of the podcast is Demystifying Mental Toughness. So yeah. on that note... I wondered, you know, how do you define mental toughness in a in a football environment? It's really interesting. It's a it's a it's a, it's a battle, an, an internal battle that I've had for quite a long time. I think labelling someone as mentally tough is is a really interesting way of putting it. And I think, from my perspective, and I hope this doesn't go against the narrative of the podcast, 
But if you're talking about being mentally tough to an under nine and at a foundation level, there's arguably something quite wrong. Um, but that's just my perspective. I, I talk about psychological flexibility quite a lot. So how can we adjust to our environment, enjoy the process as opposed to just be solely focused on the outcome all the time um, and, and really have that value driven behavior. So on helping and uh, helping players raise that level of self-awareness to have the ability to be a little bit more flexible to the approaches that, that other people, other psychs might have. So I think we're specific within a football environment, you are constantly up against it from under nine all the way through to first team football. You've got constant reviews they call them pdrs um you've got an ilp which is an individual learning plan uh, that will have detailed kind of progress reports on you at every six week interval so you're constantly being assessed um you're constantly not knowing when you're going to be retained or released uh you've got selection biases you've got relationships with coaches you've got parental influences that are, that have huge impacts on younger players um, you've got contractual issues, agents, all of these different things that can have a huge impact on on that person's that young person's experience within sport. And I think would there then be a potential issue if you labelled someone as mentally tough to suggest that if you aren't mentally tough, then you're mentally weak? And that's just something that I've battled with as a practitioner to to say the word mental tough or mentally tough. Um, and I think learning more and more about ACT and acceptance commitment therapy has, has really opened the door to a, a new way of thinking for me within sport and how to then deliver that as a, as a practitioner. I think the word psychological flexibility, whilst it might sound a bit wordy, I think it just shows that, yeah, we can be a little bit vulnerable sometimes and that's okay. And it's not always going to be this like rosy trajectory into professional sport. There's there's a huge chance that a lot of these young footballers won't even play a minute of professional football. We know what the statistics are. It's over 98%. And I think even myself as a practitioner, I've had to really say, am, am, I, mentally, am I mentally tough? Am I mentally strong sometimes? And there's definitely been moments when I'm absolutely nowhere near it. <laughs> I'd say I'm actually the complete opposite. But I think for me, being psychologically flexible gives that human nature to, to, to who we are as, as, as athletes and then also as people as well. It's good that you you, you offer a, a different angle. I'm, I'm fine with that. I suppose the point of the podcast, in some ways, is to try and help people understand exactly you know what what mental toughness is and, and what it isn't. And certainly, in Peter Clough's work, he would argue that there is no such thing as mental weakness. I know that's the that is the challenge in in sport or certainly in a football environment is getting that message out there, isn't it? Because yeah. Um, it's uh, it's often bandied around, isn't it? And in the media and by pundits and, and things like that. I, I completely agree. I think that's where you, with, with football you're dealing with something that has so many deep rooted cultural beliefs that are really hard to upturn. That when you bring in language such as that, or when the media use it so extensively and things like that, I think trying to change it with the word psychological flexibility will encounter some issues. Um, and I think. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm familiar with the work that suggests that there isn't something that's mentally weak. But as soon as you start saying mentally tough, I think that potentially could encounter some barriers. But I think it, it it's a really interesting point that you make about kind of demystifying it. Because I think, as you say, there are always going to have the people always going to have preconceptions around the idea of mental men, or being mentally tough. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, going back to the, the Peter Clough's work, I suppose what they would say is, Mental toughness essentially would be being able to deal with those pressures that you, you mentioned there about agents, about being potentially released, and how how I suppose how well you deal with and how well you cope with those pressures. Um, and at the end, I suppose at the end of the day, we all have different things that go on in our lives at different times. If we're talking about children here specifically, they might have like exam pressures. So at, at a certain time of the year, then. They might find it actually difficult to deal with like a conversation that they have yet yeah, at another time of the year that their life might be rosy and then they're absolutely fine. So it's it's slightly to, to shift every now and again, depending on what, what's going on in your life. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think just to give you a little bit of insight into how I would then promote kind of psychological flexibility within a football environment, I think it's really important to ingrain it within or integrate it within the coaching syllabus. So 
you don't have to then be there every single session delivery to enhance the message of psychological flexibility. So we have kind of three core pillars that we work from um, that we've come up with as a club. Um, so it would be diffuse would be the first one. So looking at kind of the cognitive side of, of, of football, dealing with pressure, the emotional regulation, um, trying to handle pressure. So in those really heightened moments of, of pressure, how can players then deal with that? And then we've got um, we've got expect. So we've kind of adapted it from accept because some of the coaches were thinking, well, do we want to accept low standards and mistakes? But actually, the word that we came up with was expect. So how can you expect that you are going to make mistakes? Um, you are going to experience a lot of hardship within the game. There's going to be poor refereeing decisions. There's going to be coach feedback that you don't necessarily respect or 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 believe in too much. Um, there's going to be internal work and external pressures from home. So how can you then learn to expect those things? And I think that's something that we've really tried to promote within the club. But then also lastly, the word commit. So that's kind of our final pillar. So how can we use our values and who we are and really to commit towards more value-driven behaviour that helps us understand why we're within a football academy? Um, and also that really helps parents kind of understand, well, if they're giving 100% effort, then that's all that we can ask from a player. And I think coaches have really bought into that message as well. And I think sometimes players are so, so caught up on the best performance ever or the statistical element of the game. They're constantly asking them, oh, what are the stats on the iPad? What are the distance covered? And what are the regains like? And that loses sight of the process and the reason why they're in a, within an academy setting is to really enhance them as a, as a, as a player but also as a person, we can't just give them a football education. We need to give them so much more than that. They're potentially within an academy system for close to 10 years. It, it's an incredible amount of time. So you've got to then develop a life skills program. You have to uh, enhance parent education. And I think really look at mental health and, and also the well-being of these athletes as well. Why do I say that? That's... I know. Sorry. There's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? <laughs> well, before we go with the, the mental health angle, let's let's have a look at stats. So do, do you find that stats obviously are, are helpful for yeah. players with their development, but can there be a downside as well where it can impact on their confidence if they're, if they're maybe you know, too, too tunnel visioned on stats? Yeah, we've had some really interesting conversations within, within the multidisciplinary teams that I work in. Um, We've even thought about taking the iPad away from the training ground uh, or the, the training pitch. You, you would have players that were doing kind of extra runs and asking about their speed distance and then comparing it to other people. And it would be quite toxic uh, within the environment. Um, there's also been examples of where players have been given really tangible targets from a physical perspective during a PDR process. So where they've a personal development review. And they have those kind of every six weeks. Um, and they've been given really tangible and, and hard, objective, physical stats to meet. They've met them. But what we've actually seen on the pitch is very different to the, to the data that we've seen. So in order to get the behavioural outcomes that you want, it's not necessarily what it says on an iPad or uh, those statistical measurements. Um, for example, one of the players would have would, 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 was looking to really increase their sprint distance and to decrease his overall walking time within a game. Um, he achieved all of those things. However, we weren't still seeing that real level of commitment that we were looking for within a professional development phase environment. So those benchmarks can only do so much in terms of one motivation for that player. So great that they've looked at the statistics and met those, those benchmarks, but then does that then say to the player, well, if you meet them, then you don't have to go and do the extra distances or you don't have to go that extra bit further. And that's what we were really seeing with some of the players. And but then and they would even come back to you, but, but what are you talking about, coach? That I've, I've met all the demands you've asked of me in my last PDR review, but it, 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 it is so much more than just a, a number on an iPad. Yeah, and I suppose then you've got the complexities of the teammates and how they behave and then playing styles as well, the opposition and how that then... That in, in the sort of the relationship with those stats, and it's going to be very changeable. Yeah, exactly. And 
and you've got the and, and don't get me wrong, I think there's a huge value of statistical analysis and, and, and obviously use, utilizing that data in the right, right way. It's it's at the forefront of sports science at the moment, I think. And it, it, there's so many benefits and uses of that that I've seen firsthand. And I think the skill is to use that data in the right way for the right individual um, and, and having a really nuanced understanding of how that can add value to a program, but also cause a lot of complexities within it as well at the same time. Um, and I think because different coaches and, and different practitioners will have different opinions and different preferences. Um, but I think it's something that has to be at the forefront of every program. I mean, if you look at the injury rate that we had within the academy that I'm at currently, it, we were experiencing so many different in, injury start, uh, injury types post COVID, heavy game load, uh, heavy game loading of weeks. We we're playing two, three times a week, and you were getting so many different injuries. So we had to look at the data about maybe the reasons why. Um, so that's an example of where that that is amazing. And I'm probably going out of my depth here. I'm not a I'm not a sports scientist or S and C, but. That, that's what I've learned from being with involved in an MDT process is that data is heavily valuable. But from a psychological perspective, I think there's a load of complexities that comes with it when it becomes, when there's an over-reliance on it. I suppose that's where the, the importance of knowing the individual and being able to, to spend valuable time with the individual is, is so important. The other right. So the other thing we'll we'll look at before we, we look to wrap things up would be you mentioned there about how some players can potentially be in an academy for for ten years, which obviously is a as a long time, long period, and then the you know the, I suppose the mental health impact on those players who who get released at that at that time it must be must be very very difficult i mean how do you how do you set things up as a as a psychologist so that that level of impact is is reduced ever, ever so slightly yeah i think this is something i really spoke with my supervisors about um and also during my viva actually like quite a, or nearly over a year ago now i think the importance of, of mental health screening within sport is, is is hugely important. So I've tried to bring that into the academy. So our older our older players will be subject to mental health screening at kind of three different stages throughout the year. Um, and then as a result of that, if they were to meet a certain score, they would then be triaged and, and would go through a formal process of, of clinical referral if necessary. Or I would then provide a... a, a uh, an intervention or course of intervention to to suit those individual players' needs, um, and I think having that mental referral process, a mental health referral process, and gaining buy-in from everyone within the club, I've worked quite closely with Safeguarding to implement it. There's a mental health action plan that we then um, have have kind of rolled out throughout the whole academy. So there's better mental health literacy. There's a better understanding of what poor mental health may look like. And some of the triggers and, and warning signs that people are to look out for. So just really, again, always going back to creating a more psychologically informed environment is going to help uh, promote better mental health within the workplace, but also better mental health for the, the footballers within our care. I think for the younger athletes, I, th- I think it's been really important to to gain traction with with the families and, and promote awareness there because with the older the older boys, we see them a lot more. Whereas the younger children are in our care maybe for a few hours each two on a two on a twice a week basis and then at game day. So their parents are, have more far more access to them than we do. Um so I've started kind of a a, a mental health and well being slash personal development uh, kind of monthly newsletter where I send out different resources, videos, podcasts like yourself, um, those sorts of valuable pieces and nuggets of information that can disseminate knowledge far wider than I can on my own. And I've received really good feedback from that. And there's something that has really enhanced people's understanding of what mental, good mental health can look like in a sporting setting, but also how to improve their mental health and, and overall well-being just as normal human beings as well in their everyday lives. So yeah, I think that kind of encapsulates the approach I've taken to it within sport. I mean, well, I, yeah, in football especially. It's not perfect, believe me. I think I could do more, and if I was there full time, I think that would be another consideration to factor in. But yeah, that that's where I've gone with that one, David. Yeah, it, it's such a big, big topic, isn't it? And a lot of people really 
aren't sure where where it sits in the in the the realms of being a sports psychologist. I suppose you've 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 had to learn along the way in that respect. Yeah, I, I had a really interesting chat with uh, a supervisor that I had. He was actually my assessor on my on my um, QCEP experience as well. Um, and one of the questions he asked me was like, "Do you think?" Um, a sports psychologist should be able to deal with more clinical issues on, on a lower level in terms of mental health referrals and, and, and things like that and on individual and on individual case by case basis. And I said, I, I truly believe that the, the training courses and, and the extensive qualifications that we do have as sports psychology practitioners does offer us the opportunity to develop, to kind of deliver low level intervention within that, i.e. low mood, um, stress disorders and things like that i think when you were talking about low level anxiety and, and things like that i think everyone has a, lo- a level of low low anxiety um so a lot of the athletes we do work with we 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 monitor very closely and make sure that we're adhering to the ioc mental health screening suggestions and using that triage and that formal referral process is also really really important for your practice um and i do think you do have to learn on the job and Whilst that comes with its own complexities and, and dangers, I, I, I would say, I think having that really strong peer supervision, the strong um, clinical supervision as well that I try to engage in as much as possible um, with, with clinical uh, psychologists with a sporting background, for example, um, to constantly double check and, and refer on to the right people. I think that's where you ensure the best possible service delivery and um, an ethical practice as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It is very easy to get the, the boundaries muddied and certainly having that support system around you is is, is vital. So yeah. I've loved this conversation. Um, been really, really insightful. Are you able to share with the listeners three key takeaways from, from what we've talked about? Sure. Yeah, David, absolutely. I think the three kind of messages that I would start with, firstly, the, the three R's. So if you're a practitioner entering any environment, I'd look to build rapport. That would then elicit better working relationships on both a personal and professional level. And then I think that then develops a lot of respect. And I think anyone working within a football environment needs to respect what you're doing. Otherwise, they won't give you the opportunity to show your worth. So that's something that I would really take away as a first message. Um, I think Gaining that level of contextual understanding and, and football knowledge it would be my second uh, kind of insight from, from my own personal experience of working in football. The benefits of understanding the language, the benefits of having input within certain aspects of a training session or match can really define whether that coach or whether the members of the multidisciplinary team think you know what you're talking about. So that's a, the second message. And, and, and lastly, I think for any practitioner, just really enjoy the moment that you're in because it's so easy to worry about what does the future hold for me as a sports psychology practitioner? Oh, what have I done all this work for in the past to be in this present moment? You, you, you do worry about that quite a lot, as a, especially as an early career practitioner. And I would say if you're working within a sport that you truly love and you're working as a psychologist, you're not defined by your wage packet. You're not defined by your title as a trainee. I think really just give it the, the best you can and, and that will then fuel and ignite more opportunities and and I think we're, we're very privileged to work as sports psychologists within sport um it's a cutthroat business and it's very hard to get a role but when you're in there it's one of the most fulfilling things you can do so um that's the kind of three takeaways that I would give David brilliant some some wise words there <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how wise it is for coming from a 27 year old. It might be a bit cringe, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounded uh, sounded great, and yeah, it, it, it is very very helpful for like for the I suppose the early practitioner and uh, for for a seasoned professional as well, for that matter. Um, in terms of like uh, where the listeners can find you, um, do you want to do you want to guide them, signpost them? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm on Twitter. I love using Twitter, so. Uh, it's just JHF Sports Psych is my Twitter handle. Um, and if you have any queries about any kind of performance related challenges that anyone's going through or just want to engage yourself in a bit of personal development, um, my website is www.mentologyltd.com. Uh, uh, dot so, yeah, please feel free to, to give me a shout on there or, or follow me on Twitter. Excellent. I'll 
have those details in the show notes. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, big, a big thank you for your time. Thank you very much, David. It's been an absolute pleasure. That was a fun episode to record. I love my football and getting insights into the industry from other sports psychologists and professionals on their learnings is really, really enjoyable. And I hope you found it helpful too. Now, I'm not going to waffle too much today now. I'm simply going to get you to consider one thing. To what percentage do you think the mental side of the game plays a part in peak performance on the football pitch? Is it 10% or 50%? I'm curious. What do you think? Feel free to message me or email me and let me know. For me, I feel it varies according to the level that you play at and the position. As a minimum, however, I would say it's got to be 25%. Yet, why is it that players, coaches and clubs don't work on it? That they might just see it simply as a tick box exercise. It doesn't make a great deal of sense to me, especially when you consider what a 25% increase in performance or even just a 10% increase in performance would look like. Some food for thought for you. And if you'd like to chat to me about the topic of football, sports psychology, or mental toughness development, I'd love to help you. My email address is in the show notes, or you can join the Sports Psychology Hub where you can interact with me directly. Till next time, have a fun week ahead. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.